This week we thought we would do something a little different. In today's episode we find ourselves anchored outside the fishing village of Ijok, which is on the Indonesian Sunda island of Sumbawa. And it is here that I took on my most challenging photography project to date to document the Bagan fishing process. To understand Indonesia is to understand this style of fishing. So we begin with just a little background on what Bagan fishing is before climbing aboard a Bagan fishing boat where I spent five days photographing the entire process. But that process is not complete without finishing off with a trip to the fishing village itself. Just for fun, let us know your favourite photo in the comments with a little timestamp. Bagan fishing, involving the use of lights and nets arranged around a platform, is everywhere in Indonesia. While night fishing with lights is an ancient practice, bagans are a relatively recent style of fishing. With the advent of high-pressure paraffin lamps and eventually electric light bulbs, this method of fishing rapidly gained in popularity from the 1950s. There are many different types and sizes of bagans here, including formidable static structures that litter the Indonesian coastline. But the one Jamie boarded is a long, thin, wooden, canoe-like boat with a shack and generator in the middle. Either side of the boat, outriggers run its full length, suspended by two masts and a complex network of cables. They're not used for stabilizing the boat, but for suspending the lights and nets. The boat is prone to healing, making a walk around the wonky structure of thin wooden planks a little on the dangerous side. One of the crew, Rule, explained that he has fallen in the water twice over the years. Occasionally, if the net gets wrapped around the prop, they have to get into the water. Jamie was introduced to the boat owner, Mastar, which probably wasn't his name, but his position on the boat, i.e. Master. Rule, who's been working with Master for over 15 years, is joined by crewmates Agus and Samson. Bag and fishing is only done at night and during the dark moon phases. The fish they catch is Ikan Terry, a small anchovy that's most often dried. It's a staple in Southeast Asia. Just before sundown, they arrive at the Bagan by skiff. The first thing Rule does is empty the bilges of water before weighing the boat's anchor, a large piece of concrete that's hoisted by hand. Although the boat remains in the bay, it's moved around depending on where they feel there is most fish activity that day. In the fading light, the four crew scamper around the outriggers and prepare the net. Throughout the night, the net is operated twice. It's lowered first at 7pm and raised at 10pm, and then again between 2am and 4am. Each corner of the net is taken to the four corners of the port outrigger before being lowered. With the net lowered, it's now twilight, so the generator is cranked up and the floodlights switched on. Projecting a light onto the surface of the water starts a natural food chain reaction. Plankton is attracted to the light, which attracts fish to eat the plankton, and so on. The light also attracts crabs, which had Agus scuttling around the rigging with a fishing net. With a few hours to kill, the crew can relax. They'll eat a late dinner, so a large pot of rice is prepared in advance. Cooking utensils are rudimentary, but enough for their needs. The living quarters are cramped. The wooden shack is less than two meters wide and has to accommodate the cooking equipment, electricity for the lights and personal possessions. It also doubles up as a sleeping area. When it's not raining, the crew rotate from inside to outside. This downtime allows them to chat with their wives and children on their phones or just smoke and drink coffee. And while the fishing nets will be catching small fish to be sold commercially, the crew also do their own fishing for their supper. One of the crew, Agus, straps on a head torch and uses this downtime to prepare his hand line. They spend much of the evening this way, with Agus and Samson fishing from the boat, while Rule uses the outriggers 
to drop his line. Despite the small area, the shack allows at least two of the crew to sleep, each curled up under a warm blanket as the other two catch a cigarette break. Mastar takes over cooking duties, frying up garlic and chilli in hot oil in preparation for a fried fish supper. Before each haul, the lights are turned off and with no moon, the crew are now operating in complete darkness, punctuated only by Jamie's camera flash or, in the case of the second haul, a glimpse of dawn. The large net, measuring 9 metres by 9 metres, is hoisted by hand, with the crew taking it in turns to rotate the wooden roller. As the net comes out of the water, lower lights are turned on and Mastar checks the net is closed. The weight of the catch is so big, the entire bagan heels over to port, with the starboard outriggers coming clean out of the water. The net is then dropped onto the boat and the catch spills out across the foredeck. With the lights back on, the crew spend the next hour sorting through the catch. There are different grades of Ikan Terry, but the average price for a box is around 500,000 rupee. That's around 32 US dollars. The crew's wages are often spent on cigarettes and tobacco. As dawn breaks, birds are attracted to the unwanted fish cast back into the water by the crew, including a white-bellied sea eagle. Of course, bagan fishing is only part of the process. After the catch has been boxed up, it has to be transported across the bay to Ijok's small harbour, where women help take the boxes ashore and handle the next part of the process. This is the labour-intensive, back-breaking work of laying the fish out on nets to dry in the sun. Ijok is a community of around 200 houses and is a typical Indonesian fishing village. The activities of bagan fishing and drying can be seen all over the islands, from Sumatra to Sulawesi, and at 40 kilograms consumption of fish per capita per year, it's one of the biggest fish-dependent nations in the world. Despite this man's expression, the fresh drying fish don't smell. With so much activity in the early morning light, the rest of the villagers start their daily activities, from sorting and drying fish, buying fresh produce from the mobile market, and getting the children ready for school. If, as a tourist, you visit a village like this during the day, you could be forgiven for thinking that women do all the work, while the men lie asleep at home or lounge about with friends. Remember, though, that many of the men have worked through the night, leaving the women to take over duties in the daylight hours. The entire process of fishing is a community affair here. Ijok's architecture is typical of fishing villages. Houses near the water and many within the village itself tend to be built on wooden stilts, literally balanced on top of concrete bases. In an area prone to flooding and earthquakes, wood and bamboo are the predominant materials used for construction. In among the wooden buildings, you'll find brick houses too. The secret to brick houses is to lay a brick on top of a separate concrete base, allowing for some movement of the structure when the inevitable earth tremors happen. Rubbish or refuse management is a big problem in Indonesia. With no infrastructure to support garbage disposal, it's not unusual to find a dumping ground close to shore. One thing you can be sure of in Indonesia is a friendly, smiley face. We've said it before, but it's worth reiterating here. Indonesians are some of the most genuine and welcoming people you'll find anywhere. <laughs>